Transcriptomics 3 is a course dedicated to advanced methods of analysis that will allow us to find meaningful patterns in data, especially those complex patterns that are present in big data sets. In this video, we will review the steps that we have to take to find, download, and process a data set, as well as prepare it for such analysis. This is the first part of the transcriptomics course, where we will learn about the data set as well as the questions that are posed in the study that we will follow. After the data is prepared, we will explore how to analyze the prepared table of expression. The study we will follow is an example from a publication written by Damon from a research group at a company called Genentech. Their publication is titled Modeling Precision Treatment of Breast Cancer. The publication is interesting because the authors assembled a data set of about 50 different breast cancer cell lines that represent the whole spectrum of breast cancer variations. The authors of this paper analyzed genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic data to identify molecular profiles of breast cancer. They then collected an efficacy measurement of commonly used and experimental cancer drugs on the same samples. Let's see what the benefits RNA sequencing as well as RNA expression can offer for molecular classification of breast cancer. Histological analysis of a tumor can be illustrated by looking at a mammogram, which is an x-ray picture of breast cancer that doctors use to look at early signs of breast cancer and suspected lumps. In this example, you can see that the tumor has been highlighted. Once the tumor is found, it's critical to establish whether it is malignant or benign as well as what tissue it is originating from. Once the tumor is characterized by its phenotype, additional information can be obtained by checking for the presence of specific proteins characteristic of cancer. If these proteins are known, immunohistochemistry can be used to find if they are expressed or not. Specific molecular markers are characterized for cellular events, such as the proliferation or cell death. These are typically referred to as biomarkers. Based on these biomarkers, we can know something about the tumor. And in many cases, we can develop a treatment option that is planned and tailored to the individual's profile. Protein expression, especially when it's measured with immunohistic chemistry or FISH, provides us with a select number of biomarkers that we can check for. Oftentimes, immunohistic chemistry is used in combination with gene expression panels. Here on the right, you'll see a PAM50 panel. It is a panel of 50 genes that shows their expression. High expression is shown as green and low in red. So now we can see these patterns or profiles of gene expression. Using variations of these genes, researchers started classifying breast cancer into several subtypes, luminal A, normal-like, luminal B, HER2 enriched, and basal-like. PAM50 uses a 50 gene signature that can be tested using QRT-PCR. Other panels include Oncotype DX, which has a 21 gene recurrent score, and Mammaprint, which has a 70 gene signature, of which the latter two have been approved by the FDA for use in the United States. The PAM50 is now called ProSigma breast cancer. In the online course, you'll be able to view a video on how molecular classification of breast cancer is changing the clinical classification approaches for both the diagnosis and treatment of this disease. In this video, Dr. Neil Brath will explain how next-generation sequencing data is changing the breast cancer profiling for clinical diagnostics. Dr. Brath is the Chief Medical Officer for Agendia, which is a company that is commercializing the Memprint panel for breast cancer. Breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease, both genetically as well as clinically, and there's a need for histological, molecular, and functional classification systems that can aid in the devising of appropriate treatments, as well as the predicting of clinical behavior. Histological classification has been considered a valuable tool for classification of breast cancer subtypes for decades, owing to its diagnostic as well as limited prognostic value. It characterizes different types on the basis of histological features, such as glandular formation, nuclear pleomorphism, as well as mitotic rate. Luminal A, 
luminal B, basal-like, normal breast-like, HER2+, and recently cloud and low have been identified as molecular subtypes of breast cancer on microarray-based gene expression. Hence the evolution of molecular classification that has great potential for predicting a therapeutic response. But how can this molecular subtyping be used? Because many patients characterized with such methods were observed for such a long period of time, we can assess risk levels for recurrence as well as survival. In this chart, you'll see a Mayer-Kaplan curve of survival or recurrence based on two clinical gene panel, PAM50 and Oncotype DX. These panels separate patients into three groups, high, medium, and low risk. Based on these assessments, a treatment is selected. Traditional treatments for cancer are surgery, radiotherapy, as well as chemotherapy. Each one of these treatments can have harmful side effects and are known to be effective in specific situations. For example, tumors are typically irradiated before surgery or if they are considered to be somewhat benign. Chemotherapy targets cell proliferation and often affects many other cells in the body not just the tumor that's causing severe discomfort in patients. And in some cases, this leads to complications. However, since the 1990s, there's been a new type of treatment that started to emerge in clinical use. This is targeted cancer therapy. One such treatment is called Herceptin, which is a monoclonal antibody that blocks the HER2 receptor, blocking it from receiving a growth factor and thus preventing cell growth. Now let's take a look at the abstract of the paper, which summarizes what the authors were trying to do as well as the analyses they performed. Yellow words are highlighted as the topics of this publication. Orange highlights the methods that were used, and many of them are discussed in detail throughout this course. From a quick reading of the abstract, we find that the authors used machine learning algorithms to identify molecular features that are associated with different breast cancer groups and then they associated those with treatment efficacy. Let's start by finding the molecular data that they used and prepare it for such analysis. On NCBI, data is organized into bioprojects. These contain links to publications, various metadata about samples, and if raw data is available, it can be downloaded. Here is how you find a data set and download information about these samples. This is going to be important for us to understand what we're dealing with. What a cell line is, where it is, and what other information is known about each sample can also be found here. Let's take a look at the downloaded table and see what's inside. Data is stored in a compressed format, or SRA, which stands for Sequence Read Archive. This SRA archive contains runs that start with SRR, which stands for Sequence Read Runs. If you download and extract the SRA archive, you'll find that they contain FASTQ files with extensions with underscore one and underscore two at the end. Looking at the metadata given in the project, we see that the data was produced using pair-end sequencing. This is a technique that uses simultaneous reading of each fragment from both ends, thus improving the quality of sequencing. In addition to the file name and its downloaded location, the metadata shows cell line names that are used in each run, as well as the clinical subtype associated with that sample. To save us some time, we already downloaded and unpacked this archive, preparing it for use on the platform. If we download the NCBI SRA table, we will see the names of each sample, or run name of the associated cell line as well as its clinical subtype. These are luminal, basal, cloud on low, and normal-like. These molecular subtypes have different prognosis, morphology, and patterns of gene expression. To see whether the same groups can be found in the RNA-seq data, we have to convert the SRA read files into structured data. Now it's time to convert the read data from SRA files into a table of expression, which we will be able to analyze using various machine learning as well as data mining techniques. 
depending on the type of pipeline of your choice, you can download a smaller set of 11 samples with only two subtypes, or you can download a full set of the 52 cell lines. The data will be in FPKM format, which stands for Fragment per Kilobase of Transcript per Million Mapped Reads. This means that the gene expression level is already adjusted for in total number of reads in each sample, as well as the length of a given gene. This measure is typical for RNA-seq outputs from pair-in sequencing. Go ahead and download the file, which is labeled expression genes cell lines .txt. Once downloaded, you can open the file in Excel to see the contents. The result of the pipeline will give us a table of expression. Not only is this table normalized for read count and gene length, other transformations have already been done to the table to remove genes with zero expression across all samples. Once you eliminate genes with zero expression, you end up with approximately 17,000 out of our original 69,000 genes. RNA-seq data has been shown to have skewed distributions, as well as unequal variances and extreme values that are called outliers. Most statistical tests including the ones that we use in our analyses, have an assumption of normality. The three aforementioned issues violate those assumptions. There are a number of normalization approaches that may be used. A standard approach includes conversion of values to log scale and adjusting the distribution to account for technical variability of low expressed genes. On the t-bioinfo platform, both of these can be done using quantile normalization utilities. This utility can be found on the main areas of analysis page. Quantile normalization procedures are important to transform distributions both between and amongst different samples to have the same distribution. This removes unwanted technical variation that could cause perceived differences between samples when there are in fact no differences in terms of biology. In addition, while normalizing data, we will use a log transformation that makes it easier to interpret differences in gene expression. Before we start looking at specific genes, we need to summarize the full data set. To do so, we often use a box plot that shows us all the values that are distributed between the samples. If we have multiple data sets, which is in our case a sample data of gene expression with multiple samples, Box plots help compare the samples using statistical properties. These are the mean, median, and the bulk of the data, which is the interquartile range versus the outliers. When we prepare a box plot of a typical RNA-seq dataset, we can see that the gene expression levels are heavily skewed in linear scale. The majority of the data points are lower expressed genes have very low values, between zero and 10, and the remaining outliers specifically the higher express values, or those between 10 and 16,000, are going to be barely visible at the bottom of the box plot. In this box plot, you can see that the majority of the data points that are supposed to be in the inner quartile range are barely visible. However, the outliers, which represent the top 25% of the data in the box plot, are going to be stretched out and clearly visible. This type of distribution will interfere with many of the statistical tests that we plan to use to analyze our gene expression data. Here you can see that normalization aligns the mean of samples as well as adjusts distribution. The higher the threshold, the more aligned our data will be. If we do box plots for all 52 samples, it's going to be hard to spot any abnormalities. But after normalization, data is much more visible and we can even see patterns in the data. Some samples have lower variance as well as low overall expression in the upper interquartile range. There's also an outlier sample that seems to have an abnormal high expression in the upper quartile as well as higher overall mean. But if we were to normalize only a portion of the data, it would look very different. Notice here that the means are all around 1.5 and the distributions are very similar. This tells us that normalization is dependent on both how many samples we have and which samples are normalized in this data set. Now we can use this normalized data with the clinical annotation that we have from the SRA run table to perform our analysis. In our next session, 
we'll use this data to perform clustering and identify groups of samples. Let's review the steps. Step one is the biopsy process. And in step two, this is separated into tumor and non-tumor cells. Here, single cell suspensions are magnetically labeled using a non-tumor cell depletion cocktail that's contained in a tumor cell isolation kit, according to the protocol that's included. These cocktails label non-tumor cells and thus enable the isolation of unlabeled tumor cells. DNA extraction from the tumor occurs during step three. In step four, we have sequencing and analysis. We combine data with existing samples in step five. And finally, in step six, we analyze our results. We do this by combining the data from a given sample with other data that we already know about. By comparing them to the data that we already know, we can find similarities to one of the known groups. In this video, we reviewed the steps that we have to take to find, download, and process a data set, as well as prepare it for such analysis.